So Mac, let's talk about process. Uh, the process, walk us through it, big picture. Uh, what does it look like to prepare a sermon? Give us your method, your process, your step-by-step. -step. Well, it, it should be pretty obvious. Uh, since I'm going through a book, uh, I know what's coming next. So I know what has been previously developed. So I know the flow. I, I see the context. So what I do is, to begin with, I read through the text. And I, I read through it enough so that it's in my head. Because one of the things I've learned through the years is if I have that text in my head and I leave the desk and I go somewhere else or do something else, it's still rolling around in my mind. And I'm coming up with some of the best things I ever think of in the process of not being focused on that, but just in the moments of it being in my head. So I like to have that text in my head early in the week. So. And you do that by repeated reading and yeah. just by stewing on it. Yeah, yeah, just meditating on the text. And then the second step is when I sit down at my desk and, and I go back to the original tools and w whether it's lexicons or Greek dictionary or whatever I need to make sure I'm dealing with the, with the words in the best way. Uh, obviously, I've got to get that right. So I want to know what it says. That's the first question. What does this actually say? That's the first task. So I, I develop an understanding of it. Okay, I get what it says. I've read it over and over in the English language, and I've gone back to the original, and I know what it says. So the next task is, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. So to help me with what it means, inevitably, I'll read maybe a dozen commentaries because commentaries do several things. N number one, what they do is they give me the benefit of past illumination. Hmm. I don't need to think that, that all illumination landed with me. I, I believe the Spirit of God has been illuminating the truth of Scripture for centuries, ever since the Scripture was written, and I want to take advantage of that. So I, I, I have guys I trust sources I trust, and I go back and read them. So the first thing it does is it unloads, it downloads into my mind the past illumination, which is very important to me because I don't want something new. I don't, I, don't, I don't want anything that sounds new, like I never heard that before. That scares me. I want to make sure I'm in the flow of how the Spirit of God has illuminated men in the past. Uh, I think it's very dangerous to assume that even with a Greek text in your hand, you're going to draw all the right conclusions if you ignore past illumination. And I would just add this. There is an amazing consistency to the illumination of the Word of God. You can go all the way back um, to the Fathers. You can go back to the Reformers. You can go back to the Puritans. You can go back to the American uh, you know, preachers like R.L. Dabney and, and uh, Jonathan Edwards. And, and you're going to see that they handle the Word of God essentially with the same insights and the same interpretation. So illumination in the past is really important. The second thing that delivers to me is fresh ways to understand the text. Because it's, it's like having, a, instead of me looking at this text by myself, I've, I've got around the booth eight guys past illumination, who are telling me what they see, what nuances, what richness, what depth, what um, aspects of the text come to them. So, And they're often all seeing the same meaning. They see the same meaning, but, but they, they're showing it in a, in a different they, way. They have a different way to express it. Yeah. They have a different way to connect it. To, and that's the next thing I do. I look for, immediately when I'm in that process, I look for other scriptures cross-references that would enrich my understanding of that or connect it historically or connect it doctrinally and, and broaden it and widen it and deepen it. And I find a lot of that in commentaries. I also use Treasury of Scripture Knowledge, which chases that same idea all through the Scripture. So I'm looking for a, a lot of cross-references because I like to interpret the Bible by the Bible, as you know, and people always say you have so much scripture in your preaching. Yeah, because the scripture interprets the scripture. So, so now I've got the, the significance of it. I've got all the input, uh, past illumination. I've got all the cross-references I need. And then I start thinking about the theology of it. What, what are the theological issues here? Do I know enough about them? And uh, if I'm going to expand on those theological truths, what do I want to say? So I start connecting them with... Um, 
other theological ideas or theological passages, so I have the theology right. And, and it always doesn't go in this sequence, right? I no, mean, sometimes but, but theology that, hits you when you're looking at the Greek, sometimes yeah, yeah. earlier on in your confirmation yeah. of other witnesses. So, but this is this is kind of the logical sequence of moving through. So the whole that's thing. why when I have an eight and a half by eleven sheet in which I do this, it's it's not linear. It's, it's some ideas here and some ideas here and over here there's some more ideas and over here there's some more ideas and, and then down the side there's some more as I accumulate all of that and that gives me a sort of a rough draft. So you have this basically research. You you've you've gone through and it's described research. your research and meditation. Obviously, this whole thing is bathed in prayer, in meditation, in confirmation from, mm -hmm. from church history. I'm glad you mentioned meditation because sometimes people will say to me, well, you know, how did you get that? Where did you come up with that? And I say, I just thought about it. It's the most important part of sermon prep is just to sit with the text, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and I say to guys, my chair goes forward and it goes backwards. And when it goes backwards, sometimes it's more productive than when it goes forward. I get all the nuts and bolts forward, but backward, uh, the, the, you know, you could say the science happens in the forward position. The art happens in the backward position as I begin to think about this. And I've told you before, all the time through this process, I'm asking questions of the text. What does this mean? If it means that, what about this? What about this? How does that square with this? What does that do with this doctrine? How does that, what, how do I interpret another verse over here if that's true? All those questions are, need to be answered in my mind to understand the text. And the, the whole idea of, of preparation is not the sermon, but to understand the text. Then the sermon comes together. So that's what we got to talk about next. You've described the whole research process and you have your, your legal pad with all your questions, most of them now answered. You found interesting quotes, different ways of saying it. You've been meditating on the text. You still don't have a sermon at that point. Mm. So let's talk about no, composing in fact, if, the sermon. If you called me and said, get up and preach this, it would be absolute chaos. Right. Because it's not structured. Right. So at that point, I, I think about an outline. And how do I structure this? And as I've been saying, I, I sort of start with where I want to end. Right. What am I driving at? Now I know what this thing is going to drive at. I, I can't have 15 points and now this and now this. This all has to go in one direction and end up in one glorious, uh, consummate truth. So um, I decide where I'm going with that and what that's going to be. And then I fill in an outline that moves progressively through the material. And normally, would you say your outline is kind of based on the structure of the text, or it does, is there variance there? Sometimes it's, it's you're asking questions, other times, I mean, you do different kinds of outlines. Yeah, but it's Where does that structure it's come from? It's very unusual that I would do an outline that rearranges the text. Yeah. Very unusual. Uh, all my outlines virtually follow the flow of the text because the text is making an argument. The text is making a logical argument, and I have to I have to follow that. It's not like I'm pulling devotional ideas out of this. There's an argument there, and I have to track with that argument through the text. So, so the outline almost always follows the flow of that argument. Verses one through three is point one. Four to five right, is point exactly. two. Six exactly. to eight because is point three. Because that's what the writer is doing. Right. Unless you're in proverbs, right? You know, and you're just getting. Proverbs slung out in the air, sure. but yeah, every other book, you, you have to follow the historical narrative or the logical flow. Right. And then you finally have an outline, mm -hmm. and you have to now decide what you're going to put in it. And you don't put everything that you've read, thought, and researched into that outline, or the sermon would be two weeks long. No. When I, what I do is I write out a rough draft. Um, I write out a rough draft for the, for the purpose of getting the logical flow. Um, I, I don't have the logical flow until I do that process of writing it out. On, it's, it's another sort of rough draft. But that's, now I've got all, this, all these loose ends and I'm putting them in logical flow. Um, now I know where I'm going with this thing. Um, I also know that I can't include everything in that. All I want is the flow. And there are trigger words and trigger sentences and trigger paragraphs that are going to, going to hit my mind. And there's a lot more back there waiting to be released when I when that trigger 
hits. Right, because you're not a preacher who's preaching off of a full manuscript. No. It's about, I don't know, what you have written down is maybe 10 or 20% of what you say, I would I would guess, having looked yeah. at your sermons they, and I listening like to, to think you all of, I like to think of my notes as landing lights. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to I'm trying to land this thing, right? And the, I, st- I have to stay on track, um, because I because I preach to the same people for half a century. I do have to write sentences down because I don't want to repeat myself, and and I don't want to have a lot of fallback phrases and fallback comments that are tired and have have been heard too many times. So I don't trust myself enough to be creative in the pulpit. To say it a different way, so I try. When I do write a sentence, it it needs to be a sentence that's unique. Yeah. So that I I say something with a fresh uh, spin. So are you trying to craft especially your um, thesis sentence or your kind of first words? Are you are you usually coming in with knowing exactly how you're going to start that sermon? Well, I don't I don't really get an introduction and a conclusion. Till I have the sermon sort of shape because I, yeah. I have to know wh- what I'm going to say. Then I can back up to how I want to introduce it. And you got a lot of options there. Right. You can pick a lot of ways to go. But um, sometimes the the introduction, and even though in my final notes it's the first thing I write, it may be the last thing I put in my rough notes. Right. And then when you're talking about the the telos or the end or the mm-hmm. the argument. You're talking about the the meaning and the the aha sometimes of the text. That's what everything's driving towards. Yeah, it, you don't want the aha moment 15 minutes into the sermon. Right. You, you gotta you gotta hold that back to to keep them interested. Yeah. Um, I would like to think that I'm such a commanding orator that everybody's going to be interested, but I'm not under any illusions about that. So what I have to do is captivate them. By tying them to the text, and they've learned that if they stick with this thing, there will be a moment when they will say, "Wow, I see, I see that," and it's it's ideal if that sort of coalesces at the end. Most of your illustrations in your sermons come from the Bible, but sometimes you talk about something happening in the headlines or in our world today, a worldview issue. Uh, and and illustrations for you are are they're not usually they're they're never silly stories they're they're usually something very uh, illuminating something that explains what this looks like. Yeah, the 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 times that I refer to anything in the culture is almost always in the introduction. Yeah, because I'm trying to set up a, a problem, a dilemma, um, a danger, um, a heresy. I'm trying to say this is what's wrong. Now let's go find out how to make it right. Right. But in, once I get into the flow of the text, I, I don't back into the culture. I might make an offhanded comment, but that's a setup, and I think that's a helpful setup because there you can't ignore things. I mean, in this uh, this um, long period of COVID, with everything that's been going on. You, you can't you can't be a blockhead and ignore what everybody's thinking, so you you set the hook by recognizing the dilemmas, by recognizing the challenges. By I was just talking to a, a guy who said, um, you know, I've got twelve grandchildren and I've been so disturbed and so distressed that they're living in the world they're living in, and I just didn't know what to do. And then I listened to you, and you said. God brought them to the kingdom for such a time as this. This is their time. And after setting up how horrible the world is, and then to say that, it just delivered him from that fear. So I think you, when you speak to people, you need to speak to them where they live and then on the basis of what they need to know, draw them into the text, which answers that. So unlike some preachers, you're not trying to... Um, bring the text to this century you're trying to bring your audience to that time yeah you're still between two worlds but you're more pulling them to the ancient world so i'm not tying a rope to the bible and dragging it into the present right i'm tying a rope to the people in the present and dragging them into the past you have a present problem here is a past revelation that answers it 
So let's let's finish the the thinking about the sermon. It's it's almost done. I think you've you've thought about you've done all your research, marination, meditation, stewing, thinking, writing, rough drafting. You, you've you've come up with, I mean, enough that you're gonna have how many pages? What 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 did you have an ideal? Well, the one I was working on the last couple of days, there's about eight of those little half sheets that I use, and right. I write fairly large, and yeah, about eight pages. And so you know you have, I mean, you, you always can say more than on the page, but how do you know you're done? Is it because it's Sunday morning? No, I, look, um, my brain is timed. You know, there's the old story about the guy that, when he'd get up to preach, he put a mint in his mouth, and when it was done, you know, he quit, and one day he got a button. <laughs> so... But I have an internal clock. If I didn't see a clock anywhere, yeah, I I would I would I could predictably go somewhere between fifty yeah, an hour. five minutes and yeah. and sixty two minutes. It, there's just an internal clock, so I know where I'm going without looking at a clock and trying to do some kind of mental gymnastics. Where am I with this thing? I, I just have a feeling. So even in my preparation, I kind of know where I'm going to go. But I know that this I can't stop. I have to end. And ending is different than stopping. Right. Stopping is when you say, oh, I'm out of time. Yeah. Goodbye. Um, no, I, I, I've got to end, and then I can stop. And the end may be the most important thing of all. Yeah. So let's talk about it. You, you have it. You've got a, a plan in place. You've got some notes along with you. And now you climb those stairs that you've been climbing for 51 years. And you stand in the pulpit. Well, what's happening in that moment? You're definitely not reading your notes because if you were, we'd be done in 15 minutes? Mm -hmm. Oh, think? yeah, probably less. Yeah. Um, if I didn't read out all the scriptures. Um, you, you have your Bible open in front of you. My Bible is open to and the text these and notes. the notes. And, um, you know, I, I honestly don't know what it's like to look at me when I'm preaching in one sense, but I, um, I glance over the notes. I have the pulpit. I like the pulpit high enough so that I don't have my head at, at people. I like the notes up high on the pulpit so I can look across the notes to the congregation and just glance down and see my notes without... I, I've seen guys who have maybe a somewhat extensive notes and a short pulpit, and all you're doing is watching the top of their head the whole time. Right. Uh, I would encourage pastors that there are some sensible, common sense things you can do. One is to get a pulpit that's high enough so you can look across your notes. And if you're a tall guy like you are, you know, you, that's why we've got a little knob on it. You can turn it up as high as you want. That's right. But I, I think it's important that you're, you're looking at your audience without looking at individuals. I don't know any preacher that really looks at individuals. That's distracting. Mm. Uh, unless you occasionally look at your wife to make sure she's listening, right. you you just Still kind of there. Yeah, you right. you're, you're they're there, and you 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 feel the reactions. You see the motion of the crowd. You you sometimes catch a glimpse of someone's response, but but there's a relationship happening there no, between the preacher and the congregation. Definitely. There's a conversation, even though it's a monologue. But it's you, not you feel a that. conversation that moves from one person to the next. No. You're not making eye contact with all these people. But you can feel them coming along mm -hmm. with you, either yeah. the turning of the pages. And your congregation is well-trained, and, and preaching to them is an experience. And I think every preacher who's, who's ever graced your pulpit as a guest has enjoyed it because of that, because you've trained those people on how to listen to a sermon. So talk about what... Yeah, you know, I, I I don't know even how how cognizant you are of of what's happening in the crowd, but you're bringing them along with you, and you can tell when you are. No, I, there's a there's a I don't know how to say it, but there's a sort of a crowd personality, hmm. and at Grace Church they're very rapt, yeah. they're very quiet, they move when I say look at verse six, and all the heads go down. And um, when I'm pointing out things in the text, I, you know, what I've said is I don't want a video screen in there. I don't need to be on a video screen. You don't need to look at me. You need to listen to me and look at your Bible. Yeah. And so that, that's why we don't project me 18 feet high in the front of the auditorium. That's not necessary. They need to hear me and see the Scripture. 
So uh, it's it's really it's a it's really a, a three part conversation. It's it's myself and them and the Bible. And I'm looking at the Bible and I'm looking at them and they're looking at the Bible and they're looking at back at back at me. And, and that's how it it rolls. We could say. And that's the way I like it. I want them fully engaged with the text of Scripture so that they can walk away and say, not that I heard John speak, but that I understand that text. Yeah. And I, I want to give them that gift. That, that, what I look at, at, when I get up there, my prayer to the Lord is, let me, Lord, give them the gift of the understanding of this revelation. You want them to go where you have gone during the week. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I give them enough of the process as well so that I don't just preach the conclusions. I preach the process that gave me those conclusions. Yeah. Because you're teaching them how you came to these right. conclusions. Exactly. Very you're important. teaching them how to study the Bible. Right. Yeah. Mac, thanks for bringing us on the journey. It was epic. We were, we were there in your little study nook, and then we got to climb up in the pulpit with you. And I, I think this is a great example of, of walking through... Uh, the week that has uh, dominated your your life and ministry and and satisfied your heart all these years. So thank you. Thank you, Austin.